Disciple is about the joy of becoming a certain kind of person, a person who loves like Jesus, talks like Jesus, lives like Jesus, until we ultimately become like Jesus. I thought, oh, that's Dr. Arrington. And in case you think I'm making too much of a man, I want you to remember that even Paul the Apostle challenged churches that he wrote, follow me as I follow Christ. So we need disciples. We need people who are accurate representations of Jesus, accurate representations of the gospel. We need you in the church. We need you in the marketplace. We need you in homes and families. We need you to be like Jesus. And unfortunately, some of the problems that we're having in our world today, particularly with younger generations falling away from the church, you know there's a huge drop-off between high school graduation, students going off to college, and then coming home from college. There's a huge drop-off. Now, it's less than as of in recent years, but for a number of years, that drop-off was dramatic. And I have to ascertain that perhaps one of the reasons for that drop-off of a student losing faith or at least losing connection with the church between when they graduate high school, go to college, come back home, is because we're not always presenting Jesus well. We're We're not being disciples. We don't love like Jesus, talk like Jesus live like Jesus. We're not becoming like Jesus. Well, last week or the last week I was with you, we talked about what's absolutely essential for forming Christ likeness in us. And remember what that is? It's Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus talked about the fact that you need to hear these sayings of mine. And some translations put them into practice. The message translation Work these words into your life. And we went back to a methodology for really getting a grip on Scripture because Scripture teaches us that the Bible, God's Word, is the sword of the Spirit. And if you're going to grip the sword, it's going to take all of these digits. And the Navigators, a Christian missions organization and discipleship organization, years ago used the human hand for how to get a grip on the sword of the spirit. I'm not going to review all that we covered, but let me, let me at least give you the first two so you, that you remember. You, you've got your outline. First of all, the, the index finger. The index finger reminds us that we should do what? Yeah, just it. remember tracing lines on a page. And whenever you look at your index finger, remember, I need to read God's word. And we filled in all those blanks last week. Uh, the last time we were together, go back, check out those blanks. But have you got a pattern and plan for reading God's word? If you've not got a pattern, if you've not got a plan, adopt a pattern, adopt a plan ASAP. I want to give you my favorite. It's in your notes. The Machene one-year Bible reading plan. By far, I love it. I've been through it numerous times. If you stick by that plan in one year, You'll read the entire Bible through once. You'll read the New Testament and Psalms through twice. And Pastor Rhonda, here's what I discovered when I read the Word of God through the first time. I thought, that's nice. At least as a preacher, I can say, I've read the entire book. That's nice. But here's what's so amazing about it. The more you read the Word of God, through again and again and again and again and again and again. At some point, you start seeing, especially the way the machine aid plan is built, you start seeing how all the pieces fit together. You see the beauty of it. So the index finger is what? And then we're going to hold up the middle finger along with the index finger because I don't want to be on the receiving end of just the middle finger. The middle finger reminds us of what? Here. Here. We talked about the importance of hearing the word of God. You you live in an environment in Cleveland, Tennessee, where hearing the word of God is so accessible. You've got your local church. uh, Pastor Rhonda, I've listened to her messages. She doesn't give you um, 
how should I say, a rationed helping of God's word. Every message is I'm bringing you six course, seven course meal, and it's at the best restaurant in town. And if you're not, you know, I hear this from people quite frequently in uh, this century of Christianity. I'm just not being fed. Let me just say, if you're not being fed at Church of the Harvest, it's because you're not opening your mouth. And let me, let me just say one more thing. If you're not being fed at Church of the Harvest, if you're a person who's been following Christ for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, at some point, your pastor is thinking to herself, whether she ever says it, she's probably way too nice to say it. What do I have to do? Part the mustache and stick in the bottle. <laughs> Isn't it time for you to grow up? Hear it. Hear the word of God. Hear the word of God. That's why the discipline of coming to church, you know, my wife and I, when we're not speaking and I, I speak so much. And sometimes when I speak, I speak like uh, I just returned from a trip where I spoke Friday night. I spoke all day Saturday. When I say all day, I literally mean all day. And then I spoke on Sunday. So already I've been to church more than most people go in a full month. But my wife and I, we still attend our local church when we're home. There's something about the gathering of believers and something about the presentation of God's word by an anointed pastor, speaker, evangelist, prophet, teacher. We could go on. It's, it's essential for building your life. So hear the word of God. And then I talked about in that session the availability of podcasts and YouTube uh, videos where excellent speakers are preaching the word of God. Should you use discernment? Absolutely, yes. But you should also avail yourself of all of that. Tonight, I don't want to move on into new material, okay? And let me just say something to you. One more thing, because I didn't deal with it at length when we talked. Often people begin a Bible reading plan and they get in a lull when they approach a difficult text, right. i.e. One of the reasons I love the Machine reading plan, it's got four readings every day. So it's a reading from the Old Testament, a reading from the Gospels, a reading usually from the prophets, and then a reading usually from the epistles. It will vary. Sometimes it will be one of the Psalms. And, it, and it's thought through by... The, the, the way the guy thought it out, it's amazing. You get a glimpse of how scripture comes together. The reason I love that approach, because just a straightforward approach when you start at Genesis. Now, if God tells you to do that, do it. But I want to tell you, when you start at Genesis and just start reading through, there's always going to be challenges when you hit the latter part of Exodus. How about Leviticus. When you hit Leviticus, your eyes just start watering, especially if you've got to read five chapters in one day. It's like by the time you get to the second chapter, you're wondering, what did I read in the first chapter? So that's why I like those sizable bites. And also the way uh, Robert Murray Machene built it so that it helps you understand how the text works together. But here's what I would say. A lot of people abandon a Bible reading plan when they have one or two days that they miss. Why continue? Would you give yourself grace? It is not God who will perpetuate that kind of shame. Who wants to take you away from the word of God? It's the evil one who wants to keep you from God's word. If you miss a day, if you miss two, simply say, don't wallow in shame. Your father isn't going to cause you to wallow in shame. Just say, Father, I'm so sorry. I got busy. And I should have never allowed anything to crowd out your word. But I come back and I'm ready to receive. And I want to tell you, your father welcomes you Amen. every time. So let's go on tonight. Let's go. Now, hold up the ring finger, if you would. The ring finger. Here's what it's to remind us of. Everybody say, meditate on it. The ring finger. I'm holding up all three of mine. But I, I, I'm just, so I don't wear a ring on that one, but I've got a ring on this ring finger. Okay, so let me hold up that one for you. And that reminds us to meditate on it. Everybody say meditate on it. This is one of the most neglected gifts God has given the church. Many believers are scared to talk about meditation because 
there are so many new age teachings regarding meditation. And in new age teaching, meditation is about, it's about emptying the mind. Emptying the spirit. That's not biblical meditation at all. Biblical meditation is about feeling your mind. Feeling your spirit. One of the Hebrew words for meditation is the word haga. Haga. It means to murmur or to mutter. To murmur or mutter under your breath. We're going to practice it in just a moment. Basically, it's talking to yourself. Meditating on God's word is a very focused conversation with yourself where you talk to yourself about God's word. You turn it over and over and over and over in your mind. You think about its meaning, about its implications, about how you can apply it to your life. You think about what it has to say to you, to any situation that you might be facing. The process of meditation has often been compared scripturally to a cow chewing its cud. Cows have an interesting digestive system. When a cow chews its cud, it takes grass, chews the grass up, swallows it, and at some point calls for it and regurgitates what it has just swallowed. And then what does it do? It chews it up again. It swallows it again and then regurgitates it, sends it back up, chews it some more. I know, I know it's gross. I've read a cow can actually repeat that as many as seven times. The question is why? The cow wants to get every ounce of nourishment possible from every blade of grass. The cow wants to get every vitamin, every mineral. This is a great picture of the way you and I should think about the word of God. Blessed is he, Psalm 1, 1, 2. Blessed is the one who delights in the law of the Lord and does what? Meditating on it day and night. Meditating on it day and night. The, the message translation here renders it like this. You thrill to God's word. You chew on scripture day and night. Why? Because you've become a person who doesn't want to do the Evelyn Wood speed reading approach to Bible reading. You believe that the word of God is alive and powerful. And you believe that one word from God changes everything. You believe that one nugget from God's word can radically alter the trajectory of your life. One nugget from God's word could bring the much needed healing that you've been pursuing. One nugget from God's word could turn around your finances. One nugget from God's word could create the kind of faith that you need to believe God. So you chew and you chew and you chew and you chew and you chew. chew. According to verse 3 of Psalm 1, the person who meditates, here's what he begins to look like. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. There's, there's a strength to abide in these people. They've got deep roots, a deep faith, a deep life. Uh, many people I know don't feel like they know how to meditate on the word of God. Here's what Chris Vallotton, I I love his teaching on this subject. Chris Vallotton says that to meditate can also mean to imagine, think about, envision, talk to yourself, and even seeing the truth over yourself. You, You may have never thought about it this way before, but if you know how to worry, you know how to meditate. You know, one author says that research indicates that most worriers tend to have high capacity imaginations. There are often people who are very intelligent, have a load of creative potential. Unfortunately, their imagination usually runs towards the negative. Worry is nothing more than focused thinking on a problem, a challenge, or personal pain. Meditation, on the other hand, is focused thinking on the promises of God's word. It's making a decision to focus on God's word instead of the overwhelm you feel in the moment. So let me give you five ways to meditate on God's word, and then we'll try it, okay? First of all, visualize it. 
In other words, if you're reading a narrative from Scripture, let's say you're reading John 4, the story of the woman at the well. Imagine the scenario in your mind. Imagine how it takes place. Now, you'll read the text and then just close your eyes. Holy Spirit, what do you want me to know? Holy Spirit, what did that encounter look like to Jesus? Holy Spirit, what was going on in that woman's head and heart? Just imagine it. Visualize it. Let it come to life in your mind. Here's number two. Visualize it first, second, analyze it. Just reflect on God's word, what God's word says. Live with it. Think about it over and over and over. I love the way Charles Spurgeon describes this. I've updated some of the language because he wrote a long time ago. Spurgeon wrote, some people like to read so many chapters every day. I would not dissuade them from the practice. But I would rather let my soul soak in half a dozen verses all day, then rinse my hands in several chapters. Oh, to be bathed in the text of the scripture and let it be sucked up into your very soul till it saturates your heart. Set your heart upon God's word. Let your whole nature be plunged into it as a cloth into a dye. So you got to visualize it. You got to analyze it. Third, verbalize it. In other words, just say it out loud. Okay, in your notes... Did I list Philippians 4.13 in your notes? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Good. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you what meditation can look like. Okay? So if I'm reading through and I feel like God arrests me at Philippians 4.13, I might just pause. I want us to do it together. First time we do it, I just want us to put the emphasis on I. Ready? Ready? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I. I. That's me, God. Inferiority is not going to write the word, the sentence, the paragraph in my life or in my story. I can do all things. Then next time we do it, I want you to put the emphasis on the second word. You ready? I can do all things. Uh, and we're going to stop right there for sake of time. And, and I may, may pause and think like this. God, this isn't positive thinking. This isn't a wishful hope so. It's not some far-fetched fantasy. You said I can. I can. Not I might. I can. Next time, put, put the emphasis on the third word, do. You see how this works? Yes. You're, you're saying it out loud. You're pausing, and you're thinking about each word. So you ready? Let's go. I can do. I can do. I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself. Let's start all over. Ready? I can do all things through Christ. Stop right there. Father, it's not just something for me to think about. I can take action on this. Let's put the emphasis next time on the next two words, all things. You ready? I can do all things. <laughs> Anybody starting to feel faith build? Not just some things, God, not the easy things. I can do hard things. I can do big things. I can do challenging things. I can do things I don't want to do. I can do all things. But you can't stop there or it would just be positive thinking. Next, put... The emphasis on the next two words. I can do all things through Christ. I just remember. It's not about me, Jesus. It's about you. I can do all things through Christ who, last two words, put the emphasis there, strengthens me. Anybody see how that works? So you visualize it, you analyze it, and now you verbalize it. And God, there are times that I'll do this. I was working on Ephesians 3.20 in the Passion Translation earlier this year. And I was actually in Florida, and I was on a run, and I would always get stuck on that translation because it's a little difficult to commit to memory. Uh, never doubt God's mighty power. 
Never doubt God's mighty power to accomplish all these things. He will do, uh, see, I've, I've already lost it in my mind, infinitely more than you can, no, no, but let, let me think of it in the Passion Translation. I, I know this, and I say it regularly on a run. Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, biggest dream, your uh, wildest imagination. He'll outdo them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. So sometimes you, gotta, you, you just got to stop and work on it like that. But, but here's what's amazing. So during the run that morning, God had stuck me on that passage, and I wanted to get it memorized. And uh, I was running, and all I did was say that over and over. Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. I kept going over and over and over, and I got to that part where he'll exceed your wildest imagination. He'll outdo them all, for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. And God spoke to me that day and said, Chris, I want to set your imagination on fire. <laughs> I'm like, I'm ready. Set it on fire. So verbalize it. Here's the next, the fourth. Personalize it. Make the verse personal by replacing the pronouns or names in the verse with your own name. I, Chris Goins, can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Or maybe 1 John 4, 4. You belong to God, and Chris, you have overcome them because greater is the one who is in you, Chris Goins, than the one who is in the world. Yes. That's how you meditate. And here's five, number five. Actualize it. Turn it into a prayer. Pray it back to God. I practice this almost every morning of my life. So I do my machine plan. And usually God will speak to me from one or all of those readings for the day. And then I go out to run. And while I run, I pray. And I pray through what I just read. It's powerful in terms of helping you remember what you just went through. So that's meditate on it. Everybody hold up that ring finger and say meditate on it. Now, everybody hold up the uh, pinky finger. And say, memorize it. Here's what Chuck Swindle said about memorization. Did I put it for you in your notes? I know of no other single practice in the Christian life more rewarding, practically speaking, than memorizing scripture. No other single experience pays greater spiritual dividends. Your prayer life will be strengthened. Your witnessing will be sharper and much more effective. Your attitudes and outlook. Outlook will begin to change. Your mind will become alert and observant. Your confidence and assurance will be enhanced. Your faith will be solidified. Or how about Dallas Willard? Bible memorization is absolutely fundamental to spiritual formation. If I had to choose between all of the disciplines of the spiritual life, I would choose Bible memorization because it is a fundamental way of filling our minds with what it needs. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. That's where you need it. How does it get in your mouth? Memorization. Now, I meet people regularly when I talk about memorizing things. They say, Chris, I can't memorize anything. Let's just do a test. Can, can everybody here tell me your birthday? Anybody here can't tell me your birthday? Let me, let me see. Let, let's go a step harder. How many of you could tell me your, your social security number? You know, it by, you know it by number. You know you got it memorized. How many of you... Uh, if you're married, how many of you know your spouse's birthday? Okay, getting a little dangerous. Uh, if you've got children, how many of you know at least one of your children's birthday? <laughs> Here's the point. We, we memorize things that are important to us. And you need to know this, the, the Bible. Uh, remember the first lesson we taught on a Sunday morning at Church of the Harvest on Disciple, when I talked to you about the amount of Scripture children would read, your mind is capable of that kind of memorization. Our problem these days is this. Your mind doesn't hold on to anything it doesn't think it needs. And that's why it used to, most of us, Pastor Rhonda, when we, when we first started with phones, they were just a phone in... We had so many phone mem numbers memorized, right? Yes. And then when you first got the first flip phones, yeah. you had a lot of numbers memorized. Yeah. 
Well, now you don't have to have anybody, anybody's number memorized, right? So your mind just stops doing it because your mind is always looking for ways to conserve energy. It's looking for how do I conserve energy? So never buy the idea that you're incapable of memory. Your mind is a gift of God, and it is more brilliant than you've ever thought. Here's what I would say. Take one, one scripture a month. Start with one. Start with one. See what happens. And you say, Chris, do you use a mnemonic device when you memorize? No. Now, I've done that memory training course. You know what it did to me? Confuse me. When you think, it's mnemonic devices are basically, when I think of Todd, I think of a green shirt. I think of, you know, I, I pick out some dominating feature about Todd. And so that picture comes to mind whenever I see Todd. So I'll, I'll remember, I'm, I'm going to forget the green shirt. And here's the problem. What if he wears a red shirt next time? <laughs> Here's, here, here's what I've come to believe. Now, now, now there are some times when there's, there's such an attachment to something about a person that, that I do. I do tie that to some kind of picture. When, when it's natural, when it's easy, when I don't have to work to come up with association, I do tie that to, to, to that memory device. But, but my method and mode of memory is this simple. Uh, I sometimes am good with names, so my method and mode of memory is, hey, I'm Chris Goins. I'm Todd. Yeah. You're Todd. Todd Haggard. Todd Haggard. Todd Haggard. Todd. I'm going to say that three or four times. I'm going to try to say it, and I'm going to say it while I look at him. Todd Haggard. Todd Haggard. Todd. Todd. And I'm going to try to make it feel natural, not, not weird. But... <laughs> But I'm going to say it as many times as I can. Here's, here's the reason why. Now, I grew up in church, so I've turned this into an art form. Here's why. If I don't do that, I'll walk away from that encounter. I'm Chris. And you're Todd. Todd. Todd, good to meet you. And I'll walk away from that. And then I'll need something from Todd. Oh, Christ. he just told me his name. What is his name? What is his name? So I come up. Hey, brother. Can you... Can, Everybody becomes brother and sister. It's the Christian cheap way to not memorize names. So let's try this. Here's what I do with the scripture. It may not be your way to do it. I just know it works for me. Psalm 119, 101, or Psalm 119, 11. I've hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. I've hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. I've hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. I've hidden my word in my heart. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119.11. Psalm 119.11. Psalm 119.11. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I may say that 100 times. Now, now you say, Chris, what's happening during that time? Well, first of all, that word's getting solidified here. Yeah, chewing it. Now... The next day, what happens when I come back, just like I struggled with Ephesians 3.20 a minute ago out of the Passion Translation? You're going to have times when your memory needs to be jogged. What do you do? You don't browbeat yourself. I keep a list of what I'm currently memorizing in Scripture. And I just pull it up, look at it, jog my memory, and go on. And then repeat it over and over and over and over. And then here's our problem. Some of us will commit a passage to memory uh, on September 11th, 2024. We won't use that passage again for three months and then be surprised, why can't I, why can't I remember it? Constantly pull those scriptures out, meditate on them. You know, th there used to be a thing in the liturgical church world called the daily office. And anybody gr grow up with that, that format? Where you would, you would pause several times a day that it was called the daily office, but you could do it regardless of where you were. And there were certain hours that you would just stop and you would worship, you would pray, 
you would meditate on scripture. There is a helpfulness to that because a lot of us, the reason we can't get more of it in us is we look at it in the morning, but we don't think about it again until we collapse into bed at night and sometimes not even then. So memorizing, memorize it. Here's what memorizing God's word will do. Number one, it will help you resist temptation. I believe that with all of my heart. Number two, memorizing God's word will help you make better decisions. It will help you make better decisions. Why? Because you're, you're forming a grid through which to sift decision making. Three, memorizing God's word will give you strength and stability when things get really difficult. I'm convinced that we may be going through a storm. If you want strength for the upcoming storm, memorize God's word. It will give you strength and stability when things get difficult. Some practical suggestions on how to memorize. Pick a verse that speaks to you or a situation you're currently experiencing. Say the address of the verse before and after the verse. Say the address before and after. Psalm 119, 175. Oh, this is one of my favorites. Let me live that I may praise you and may your law sustain me. Psalm 119, 175. Let me live that I may praise you and may your law sustain me. Psalm 119, 175. Third, read the verse out loud several times. There are three simple keys to memorization. Here they are. You ready? Three simple keys. Repetition, repetition, Repetition. <laughs> Emphasize key words when quoting the verse. You might want to create a flashcard system, digitally or on paper. Use scripture as a screensaver. Put, put the verse to music. Make up a melody in your head. Have you ever done that? I'm not demonstrating any that I've made up because sometimes they're rather entertaining. But, but, I do. Sometimes it's just natural. I'll make up some kind of song to the scripture. Okay, let's go on because I want to get through all these before, before um, I exhaust our time. Here, here's the thumb. You're holding up the thumb now. So we've got all five digits raised. Let's see if we remember what these are. We're starting with the index finger, which is read. Everybody say read it. We go to the middle finger, which is? We go to the ring finger, which is? We go to the pinky, which is? Now we go to the thumb, which is study it. Acts 17, 11 describes one of my favorite groups of people in the Bible. They were a group of people known as the Bereans. They were from a town called Berea. Bible students affectionately refer to them as the Berean Christians. They became a model and a p pattern for what it looks like to hear truth taught, reflect on what's being taught, and then test it with your own diligent study and research. Here's what Acts 17, 11 says. The Jews proved more generous-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they accepted the message most eagerly and studied the scriptures every day to see if what they were now being told was true. They searched the scriptures and they studied. They didn't leave the study of scripture to the professionals. They did it themselves. Jerry Bridges said it this way, reading gives us breath, but study gives us depth. Let me give you a passage that's just a great passage. Proverbs 25, 2, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search out a matter is the glory of kings. If, if you listen to my teaching today, one of the things that you're going to know is that every one of you is a king or a queen. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. In other words... God hides some things, but he's not hiding them from us. He's hiding them for us. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search the matter out. Study. Paul challenged Timothy, study and do your best to present yourself to God. Approve. Here's the difference between reading and studying. It comes down to two things. When you study the Bible... You always ask questions about what you just read. 
and then you write down or record your thoughts. Here's the secret to effective Bible study. It's asking questions about what you're reading and then writing down or recording the insights the Holy Spirit provides. And the ability to ask the right questions is an ability anybody can acquire. So let me give you six classic questions that Bible students have been asking for centuries. Who? Anytime you read a text, ask yourself who? Who wrote it? Who said it? Who are the principal people involved? Who? Second, what? What did they write? What did they say? What was taking place? Third question, when? When did they write it? When did they say it? What was the historical context? When? Next question, where? Where did they write it? Where did they say it? What was their cultural context? Next question, why? Why did they originally write it? Why did they originally say it? And then how? How does this apply to my life today? I think I put all of that in your notes, didn't I? Three great what questions. Here are three more great what questions. What does this passage teach me about God? Who he is, what he's like, what he's done. What does this passage teach me about me, about human beings in general, about me in particular, about what? We were meant to be what I was meant to be, how we were meant to be, how I was meant to be, what has gone wrong. And then third, what question? What does this passage teach me about the way I'm supposed to respond? What has God done to address what has gone wrong? What does he expect me to do in light of what he has done? You ready for some more great questions? Nine great questions. By the way, put these in your arsenal. I used to carry a little booklet around of questions to ask to stimulate my thinking because I had read that if you want to be wiser, learn how to ask great questions, especially when you're with great people. Does this passage confront me with a sin I need to confess? Does it, confront, does it contain a promise I need to claim? Does it challenge an attitude that needs to change? Does it include a command I need to obey? Does it provide an example I can follow? Is this passage a prayer that I can pray? Does this passage demonstrate an error I need to avoid? Does it hold the truth I need to believe? Does it point to something I need to thank God for? Aren't aren't those great questions? Put those to practice. Let me give you four essentials for interpreting Scripture. So almost weekly now, somebody has come up with a novice interpretation of Scripture. And it's so weird and it's so wild and then it confuses the body of Christ. There are four essentials for interpreting Scripture. Here they are. Number one, Scripture interprets Scripture. God's word will often interpret itself. In some instances, another writer in the Bible will interpret another passage of Scripture. Second thought, context interprets Scripture. The surrounding verses, chapters, the book of the Bible, the passage appears in, all provide context. Don't make a doctrine out of a single verse. You need to know the context. Three, intent interprets Scripture. All scripture has an intended meaning. Scripture always has one specific interpretations, interpretation, but multiple possible applications. And then four. The clear part of scripture interprets the unclear or the obscure parts. So let me, let me share with you some of my favorite tools. Okay. I've first started studying the Bible old school. Pastor Rhonda, I think, will remember this. You, you had the Bible that was as big as you. You got an arm workout just by carrying your Bible. And then, yeah, then you had several, well, you had several study Bibles, too, because one Bible couldn't contain it all. So I started with the Thompson Chain Reference, the Dakes Annotated Reference Bible. Then you've got to add the NIV Study Bible. Then the ESV Study Bible came along. Then the NLT Study Bible came along. Then the Reary Study, well, before that was the Reary Study Bible. And all these study Bibles. Nave's Topical Study Bible, thank you. (laughs) Had all of those books lining the shelves. Uh, Then then you're right. You've got to get a Strong's Topical Concordance. 
that, yeah, it's, it's humongous. And you could literally hurt somebody with that book. Yeah. But th that's the way I started. And, and it was expensive, and it took up lots and lots of space. Today, on this laptop, I've got probably the equivalent of a twenty or $30,000 library. And it didn't cost me twenty or $30,000. Uh, I love Logos Bible software. I love it. I use it every day. You may have a different system or software. I would encourage every Christian to get it. It's easy to use. They provide free help seminars for you. And here's, here's what's amazing, what it does to your study time. I'm still studying the same amount of time I've always studied, maybe more. But used to, by the time I got out every one of those books and looked up every one of those references, just getting out the books and getting out the references would take hours. And now I click, 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 click. And I've got all of this immediately accessible. And then because of copy paste availability, I'm able to not read that and forget it. But if it really hits me, I copy and paste it over to my note page. It's so invaluable for studying. Do I think you have to have it? No, I don't. But I think, I think we splurge on a variety of things. You know, I, I know hunters who are serious about hunting. They'll save, save, save until they can buy the new rifle, the new deer stand, the new this, the new that. Serious students of God's word, they also save because I want to know God's word. And I need some help. So I put for you, and by the way, somebody says, but Chris, I am totally broke. Blueletterbible.org. How many of you have used blueletterbible.org? Two or three? Totally free and a wealth of Bible resources at your availability. Totally free. A lot of the stuff I just mentioned, it's totally free. The reason I like Logos is because it tracks all the notes I'm making. So it keeps all those things I'm marking in commentaries, it keeps up with all that for me. But Blue Letter Bible, before I just got Logos last year. Before that, I was using Blue Letter Bible and a variety of other online softwares. Cool? Here's number six. Now let's fill out the final blanks. Apply it. Put it into action. The Bible was not given to increase our knowledge, but to change our lives. It wasn't given for our information, but for our transformation. When we read the Bible, it reads us. Allow it to read you and allow it to change you. The goal of getting into God's word, reading, hearing, meditating on, memorizing, studying it, isn't more information. It's revelation that leads to application for the purpose of transformation. That's why we read the Bible. Apply it. If you're not getting to that stage, you're, st you're stopping short of the goalpost. It would be like driving the football all the way down the field, getting to the one-yard line and saying, I'm good. No, put it in the end zone. Apply it. Now, let me end by, by giving you a base fitness strategy. Um, I don't look like it. But I, I place a huge value on physical fitness. Huge value. It, it affects so many things about my life, and there's a reason for it. It's not vanity for me. Uh, I, I can tell that attentiveness to my physical health has an impact on my mind, my mental health. I, I've struggled with depression. Once you've been there, you don't want to get back there. So I, I know that I can very easily drift into, into depression. F physical activity, what I eat, all of it plays a role in my mental health, my emotional health. I've told the story of uh, almost wrecking my marriage because I became so emotionally unhealthy. Physical health helps me keep my emotions on an even keel. But if you ever start training, um, if, you, if you ever start training, and I, I train every day somehow, 
One of the things that you, you will notice is uh, those who really want the best for you physically. Now, now there, there are some. I don't go to the classes where we're, we're doing the bodybuilding thing. I'm, I'm never going to look like any of those dudes. The rock, that, I admire them, love them, yay God for them. They're awesome. But Chris Goins is, is not going to get there, and I don't care about getting there. don't have the time or money to do that. But I did want an approach that, that was balanced. So here's BASE. BASE stands for, if you're ever doing physical fitness, it stands for balance. By the way, as we get older, what's one of the things we struggle with? Balance. And we could, we could even go through those exercises, right? By standing on one foot. It, it's helpful just to do this occasionally. To, to allow your body to build balance ability. A is for agility. You need agility. Uh, w- one of the things, some of the fitness stuff I've taken, what they want you to be able to do are things you do in daily life. Walk upstairs, walk downstairs, bring in the groceries, pick up X, pick up Y. Do those things that matter. S, strength. You want to build strength. As we get older, muscle mass deteriorates year after year after year. But you can purposely build strength. And then E is for energy and endurance. Now, I didn't do all that to give you a physical fitness class. But it helps me think in terms of why I, why I go to the Word of God every day of my life. So this morning, I knew it was going to be a long day. I knew it was going to be a long day. So really early. I was up, and the first thing I do is meet with God. And I talk to him for a second, and then I open his word. And I usually pray something like this. Isaiah, I think it's 50 verses 4 and 5. The sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to hear as one being taught. Father, as I open your word, give me eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart and mind to know, understand, and obey all that you're going to say to me through your word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from you. I don't know what I'm going to face today, but I know that your word has what I need. Meet with me in your word. I open my notebook that I've prepared digitally. And I begin to read the word. Here's why I do it. Remember that base? First of all, I know that by reading the word daily, I'm going to acquire biblical balance. The word of God's going to help me stay balanced, especially in a world that's unstable, polarizing, and unbalanced. The word of God gives me stability and balance. I won't be prone to get off on all kinds of weird beliefs idiosyncrasies that could take me somewhere I don't need to go. It gives me biblical balance. Two, it gives me biblical, biblical agility. And agility is defined as the ability to move quickly and change directions while maintaining control and balance. I want that in the spirit. And I've been trying to lean into that more and more. I mean, uh, a few days ago, scared me to death like I had prepared really hard a full message for the church and then on a whim I felt the spirit change it just as I was walking up now I don't do that I'm not built for that like that freaks me out big time when I say it freaks me out like I brought uh there are 52 pages in this outline and it's manuscripted that I wrote for you guys that makes me real comfortable because I know if I don't have anything to say at least I can read Okay, but, but here, here's the agility that spending time in God's word brought me. I'm like, hold on. I've committed to the spirit that when he leads, sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen as one being taught. I've not been rebellious. I've not turned away. I'm not, I'm not going to ignore that leading. That's agility. I leaned into it 
God showed up, showed out. I knew he'd showed up and showed out because the message made sense. I left and said, that was you, Lord. It wasn't me. Thank you for being you. Three. Reading God's word, studying God's word, memorizing, meditating gives biblical strength. I love Daniel eleven thirty two. The people who know their God will be strong and take action. I need strength these days. So I, I study God's word daily for strength. Four, it gives me biblical energy and endurance. I love what Jeremiah said. Your words were found. I ate them and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. Uh, so about nine days ago, my wife has had some physical problems and uh, she came to me. She came to me and said, hey, uh, actually, she just told me what she was going to do. She said, uh, hey, I'm starting this Monday. Will you start it? And it's a, it's a really restrictive eating plan. And I, I, don't, I, I don't necessarily want to tell you what it is because I'll have four people come up and tell me why we shouldn't do it. And I'm not going to listen to you because I'm, I'm doing an experiment. And I'm going to stay with my experiment, okay? So we're now going into the 10th day of that experiment. And, and it's a really tedious way. Like, I've always been attentive, at least since I made this commitment, but this is really, really defined, like mega defined. And uh, look, look, here's, here's what I know. Because the program is so defined, I've done a lot of fasting on this program. <laughs> because I can't fix the food I'm supposed to be fixing. So I just go without it. And here's what I'm discovering. This last point was energy and endurance, right? You got to put something in the body to get something out. And if you don't put something in, you're not going to get much out. Your body can't live by fasting alone. It was crying. In fact, one night I said to my wife, we were laying in bed and I was, I was laughing about how exhausted my body was on this particular day because first few days it was flying. But first few days I was really attentive by doing this menu I was, I was supposed to do. Then I got busy and had to work. So I hadn't got to do the menu. So I just thought, well, if I'm not doing the menu, I'm just going to, I'll just fast. Well, you can do that a little bit. And it's good for your will. It's good for your relationship with God. But, but then I was feeling the endurance thing. So here's what I'm saying about this. Give your, give your spiritual life the appropriate nutrients it needs. Don't fast God's word, either in reading and studying and meditating, memorizing, any of those things. It needs nutrients. If you don't give it those nutrients, what you may find out is what I discovered for about two days. Chris, you're going to crash unless you give this thing some fuel. You need fuel to run on. So everybody hold up your hand, and then Pastor Rhonda's going to come. Index finger is what? Say it out loud. Three. That middle finger is what? Here. The ring finger is what? Right. The pinky finger is what? Right. Yeah. The thumb is what? Right. And the palm is what? Right. If you do that, you'll get a grip on God's Word, and that'll help you as you become like Jesus, a disciple of Jesus. I've loved being with you this round, Pastor Rhonda. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And uh, hey, let me, add, let me, add, oh, uh, yeah, come on up. Uh, I was just going to say, does anybody have any questions or feedback? I, I meant to finish it at 8 so we could do that, and I saw it was 8 11. But, but does anybody? Say, 